Do 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 la 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 la. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to Practically. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. My name is John Stevenson, and uh, oh, you can see my uh, see my house today. There we go. <clears throat> Uh, so welcome, thank you for joining me. Today we're going to have a spectacular video because uh, we're going to be talking about spec. Uh, so we're going to have a very gentle introduction into Clojure spec and uh, help you understand what it's all about and do some simple examples to get you going. Uh, good morning, Paddy. Thank you for joining. Thanks for everybody for joining. If you've got any questions, then please feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them as we go along. Uh, as usual, the um, oh, thank you, thanks, Simon. Uh, so, as usual, all the videos uh, available from the uh, website I've got, they're all on YouTube. I've put various uh, playlists on there as well. I'm going to update this web page in a couple of days to add all the uh, different uh, playlists, so they're a lot easier to find. I appreciate the uh, the YouTube uh, interface isn't always the the easiest to find things in. And uh, working on the books, the uh, Space, Space Max books is fairly complete. I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, investment into the Closure and Closure Web Apps book as well, and some work on the Closure Script book over the uh, next uh, three months. And uh, the Web Apps one uh, helps you build uh, websites, uh, back end websites with Ring and Composure. And the Closure one will be a nice introduction into uh, Closure, but also how to uh, think uh, functionally in Closure as well. If you want to get in touch, then uh, Closure in Slack is a useful place to uh, reach out to me. And there's a free a link there to get a free account if you don't already have one. And subscribing, we've got, we've got over 400 people subscribed to this channel, so that's quite nice. <coughs> uh, more people joining every day, so that's great. Uh, and thank you everybody who's donated either via PayPal or uh, GitHub. Uh, it does help uh, keep the wolves from the door. <coughs> Okay, uh, so what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about spec. So there was uh, this blog post from Rich Hickey back in uh, 23rd of May 2016. So it's been around for quite a while. Um, I think spec is something that's taken a while for people to start adopting, but I think uh, it's becoming more prevalent now. <clears throat> and it's something very much additive to closure. It can make closure development um, <clears throat> A lot better uh, so one of the aspects is better communication so you can communicate your intent uh, very clearly um, so not just comments but in in terms of uh, expressing the the structure the data structures that you're working with and because like everything in closure is a data structure then uh, it is useful to be able to kind of codify that uh, and then you can take that specification, use, use it to check that your program is working correctly. You can test it. You can also do generative testing as well. So you can get, you can use spec to create uh, tests that would otherwise be uh, probably missed by your own kind of uh, uh, testing as well. It's very hard to come up with uh, cases where all the aspects of a test, all the different kind of edge cases are covered. Uh, and doing generative testing can can really help uh, test more of your application than you would otherwise uh, probably do. And also it saves a lot of code. Uh, it saves a lot of you writing code uh, to cover all these edge cases. It will kind of help you do that as well. That's not something we're going to cover today, but we will kind of build up to that as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, improved developer experience. So. If you've been using Closure Spec since uh, well, since after 2016, I'm not sure exactly when they put it into the language, but you, if you're using Closure 1.10, you'll certainly see in the error messages you'll see um, a different approach to the error messages. So they're actually including uh, Spec uh, output. So you might see uh, sort of a a spec map telling you what what the issue is uh, about a certain uh, error uh, 
So it does help uh, communicate exactly what is going on uh, when there is an error. Uh, again, I think it's uh, it does take a little bit of practice to get to understand how they're working, but going through some of the things that we're doing today will actually help with that as well. And yeah, you know, building more robust software. So you can, if you're building a, a closure system and it's all self-contained, it's all closure, it's not pulling any other uh, interesting formats from outside the world, we're not pulling in JSON and so on, uh, or we're not talking to databases, then <clears throat> it's fairly easy to do like a, a defensive coding and make a very robust closure uh, application. But if you're pulling in information from different places or you're using a lot of uh, uh, data transformation, then <clears throat> using spec, oh, excuse me, using spec can help um, ensure the correctness of your code, it helps you check uh, what's going on, and it also explains why things aren't working. So those are the main things we're going to cover today, just uh, how to do, write your first spec and uh, and how to test that spec works. And we're going to create a little uh, sort of bank account specification. Uh, so this blog post is, is, is the same, more or less the same as this closure spec rationale uh, and overview. I think there's a little bit extra stuff in here as well. Um, uh, so that's quite useful kind of background to read. I'm not going through that. Uh, obviously, things like keep it simple, but it is worth having a, a quick look through once you um, once you decided that you want to try uh, spec uh, on your application. But for the uh, the real hands on stuff, then <clears throat> uh, the spec guide is the the most useful. It gets you going straight away. <clears throat> Ooh, excuse me. Apologies, I seem to have a bit of a cough this morning. <clears throat> okay, uh, so the code I've shared today is is kind of going through this, but with some tweaks. And I'm going to explain uh, a little bit more around some of the things we're doing here as well. <clears throat> so what I did first was create uh, an application. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I created a closure project. Uh, projects. Oops. Uh, where is it? Uh, <clears throat> oh yeah. Spec. So I created this project called Leveraging Spec. I've just used the uh, was it closure. Uh, nope, that's not it. Closure minus a new. Uh, and then I did practically. Uh, uh, yeah, so I just uh, used the closure CLI tools and uh, depth seeding to create a depth seeding project. <coughs> And if we look at the project, then it's just uh, yeah, it's a fairly standard closure project with the source and test directories. So I've just created a, a leveraging spec, and I'm going to create some specific um, <clears throat> examples in their own namespace as well. <clears throat> uh, and I'll put some tests in there. There isn't really any tests yet, but I'll put some tests in there as well. Uh, I've shared the leveraging spec as the the gist, and I'll, I'll put this uh, project up as a repository uh, uh, soon, by the end of the uh, broadcast. Uh, you don't need the full project; it's just uh, going through leveraging spec. The the, the code we got, we can just evaluate the uh, the specific <coughs> uh, expressions. Uh, okay. Oh. Oops. So this is the code. So what we've done, all we've done is just uh, add this require. If we look at the depths.eden file, uh, boom. Uh, if we look at 
Uh, see, all we've got is just Clojure uh, 1.10. Well, this is 1.10.1. This is the latest version of Clojure. But as long as you're using Clojure 10 or above, then you're fine. <clears throat> uh, okay. And then, uh, so some of the examples where you would use Clojure spec, things like API requests. Uh, so we've seen that where we've used uh, schema, uh, prismatic schema, uh, and uh, to basically ensure that the, the data coming in is of the right form, uh, is of the right structure, and the kind of right types of values. <clears throat> and that's a kind of a, like an obvious place where you could use spec, where data is coming in or data is going out to an external system. And uh, so there is, uh, there is a difference between schema and spec um, and I'll, I'll show a good article that covers that uh, in the uh, in the notes uh, but there's also checking data is pulled and pushed from like message systems like Kafka and Tibco uh, Tibco is just like the uh, the classic version of Kafka that costs an awful lot of money <laughs> but uh, enter and it's enterprise <clears throat> um, and there's other things like uh, what we were doing previously with the uh, the COVID-19 dashboard, we were using Vega Lite, which displays visualizations from a data structure. So it's basically you create a data structure and that drives the, uh, the visualization of that data. Uh, and so you could use data uh, specifications to make sure that that data structure you're creating is, uh, is correct. So that um, uh, if you're, if your visualization is not showing up, then you have more information about why that might be the case. Because if it's failing the specification, then you, you may have missed something or you may have uh, using the wrong type of information that it requires. <clears throat> and then we'll also see this examples of using that for like wrapping um, uh, function calls. So you can wrap, uh, you can create a spec for your function uh, arguments as well to make sure that uh, the information that you're sending to functions is is of the right form. <clears throat> okay, uh, so we're going to go through some of this stuff that's in the closure guides, uh, and it talks about uh, predicates. So predicates in closure are basically functions that return uh, a true or a false or a falsy value. <clears throat> so we've got things like odd one. Oops. And more fingers and thumbs this morning. Here we go. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, so yeah. So and by convention, we uh, put these question marks on the names of the predicate functions. That's just a convention. It still would work if you uh, if you didn't put on there. There's nothing uh, significant in terms of what closure reads in terms of the question mark. It's more for human beings, uh, so it's a, uh, a convention that we use in closure. Uh, there's quite a lot of predicates. I think there's about twenty or thirty predicates. I think I did create a list at one point. Um, and so there's a question from the uh, chats. Can we use pre and post functions? I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about pre and post function, uh, pre and post in function definitions this time, uh, but I will include it in uh, uh, the next the next video. Um, uh, there is some similarities because one of the things you're doing with spec is um, is defining a contract. Uh, you're defining a contract for especially when you're calling a function. You're defining a contractor on what and how to use that function uh, and pre and post conditions kind of do the same thing um, but there there are some differences and i'll go to that i'll go into that uh, in a different broadcast that's quite useful to uh, have a comparison of that <clears throat> okay predicates so we've got uh, predicates they're just part of the closure core already uh, so there's nothing new there hopefully you've come across those already uh, and you can also have predicates that test for um, type. So you've got string. Oops. 
<coughs> uh, am I a string? Yes, I am. A true. <coughs> and uh, then we've got like things like uh, is something an int? And if we do something like two point three, that's oops, that's not right. That might convert it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and obviously, if it's not of that type, then it's going to uh, say no. It's going to be false uh, because yeah, if we if we check the type of two point three, oops. let me see. It's a double. It's not an int. So uh, it's some of these predicates are based on the the underlying types of closure. Uh, and just as a reminder, so even, even though Clojure is a dynamic language, uh, which means you don't have to specify the uh, the types uh, that you're using uh, explicitly. So if I just want a string, I'm just putting it in double quotes. If I'm doing an integer, I just do a whole number. If I want a double, then I do a, a decimal number. Um, that you don't need to specifically type uh, int one uh, uh, double 2.3 um, but there are types underneath so you can check uh, that so it's all it is strongly typed because uh, especially because it's uh, when it's on Java uh, because it's using all the Java objects which are all uh, a huge range of types there uh, okay so we can we can take the predicate functions and, uh, and and use them as the basis of uh, our specification because we want to define a specification that tells us uh, tells us something. So, uh, does a value conform to a specific specification? Uh, is it going to return like true or false in this case? So, using a predicate is a very easy and obvious way to to use specs. Uh, so, just as a point, I've included the closure spec. Uh, dot alpha um, library uh, and I've given it the the name spec some people use the, the single character s um, that kind of makes me uncomfortable using single characters uh, especially if you're going to mix spec in with other things s could stand for anything so I, I prefer using uh, spec which is more meaningful alias to me uh, and the library is called Alpha because there there is a new version coming out called version two, and there's going to be enough differences that a few things will break, but not. Uh, but they're more kind of the kind of more the edge cases of spec. So although it says Alpha, it, it is usable, um, but there may be some things in spec uh, in spec version two that actually break. Uh, a few of the things break a little bit of the API. That's why they've called it alpha, uh, because they haven't 100% uh, uh, ironed down the um, the API for spec. <clears throat> and so uh, when they do, then the the alpha will will disappear. Uh, and so this will kind of so there'll be a, like a closure spec uh, when the API is is fully uh, realized. Uh, because it's important to get this kind of thing right. It's going to be a centerpiece of closure uh, for the next kind of 10 years, I think. It's like when you're doing any closure applications, uh, people are going to be using spec, uh, just like people are using uh, like uh, closure.test or other libraries uh, regularly as part of their application. Um, okay. So back to see how it works. Let's have a look. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we've got spec. So we've got this spec conform, which is a function that just basically takes a a, a specification and uh, like predicate test here and a value. And if it's uh, if it does conform, then it's going to return that value. Um, whereas if it doesn't uh, conform, so here we're using even predicates. Obviously, one hundred one as a as an integer is not even. So it's going to return closure.spec.alpha invalid. Um, so it makes it very easy to kind of test for the um, uh, the accuracy of the spec, whether it's uh, whether it's conforming. If it's returning this invalid uh, key, and this is essentially a, a keyword uh, that it's returning. Uh, it's a fully qualified uh, keyword, so it's got the full namespace to which it belongs. And so it's a keyword because it's it starts with uh, 
um, a, uh, oops, it starts with a colon. Uh, yeah, so you can see it's, it's doing, if I take the comment off, it's doing the syntax highlighting uh, for me there. <clears throat> so it's returning this keyword, uh, closure alpha, uh, closure.spect alpha invalid. So this is basically saying it's deviating from uh, the specification, uh, and then we we kind of need to figure out what to do to uh, to handle that. Um, and so there's quite a few, there's a few little examples that came up with here. Obviously, conform uh, we can test the the type uh, of something as well. So is it the right type? Is it the uh, here we're typing uh, testing whether it's a uh, a sequence, so we can see that where, where a vector is not a seek, uh, and then doing something like range ten actually is returning a sequence as well. So it's uh, we can kind of not just do um, simple values; we can also test like complex values as well. So it's it's working the same way because these are just closure uh, core functions. Then we just use them in the normal way uh, we would use it outside of closure, outside of spec. Uh, it's just that we that what spec conform is doing is adding this uh, uh, this return value uh, rather than returning uh, true and false. We're actually returning uh, the what it calls the conformed value. Um, so when we do this, uh, this value one is the value we're passing into the spec uh, or testing with the spec, and the return result is what they call the conformed value. Um, and so the conform value is either the value that we passed in uh, or we're returning this invalid uh, value instead. Uh, yeah, I think that's a fairly straightforward examples there as well. And if you prefer to just have true or false, you can use uh, valid instead of conform. Um, and we'll see kind of some of the differences later on when we do when we do bigger specs we can kind of see the differences in what they're doing there um so again you see the valid is also checking the value against the specification but this time it's returning true or false rather than this so we don't get this closure we don't get this key keyword closure spec alpha invalid so evaluate even is true Our string we get true as well uh, and both with valid and with conform, instead of just using a predicate value, we can also use our own custom function. So here we've got a little function that basically returns uh, where, whether something is uh, true or false anyway. So it's it's uh, it's uh, a predicate function of by its action. Um, so here we're taking in a value, and we're just checking to see whether the value is is bigger than. Uh, 10,000, uh, which is true. Uh, and uh, this is just a short form of that as well. And we can do the same thing. We can use that with uh, conform as well. Uh, um. Uh, cool. Any questions so far? So these these two functions uh, from spec are helping us test a uh, specification, and we've just used very very simple specifications so far. We've basically just used a predicate or uh, this anonymous function. Uh, I'm not going to go down that example today. I'm going to cover that later on. Um, So some examples we can use we can use values. Uh, so we can use a set here. Um, so you may have seen in previous videos we've done something like this using the sum function from Closure Core, uh, and we give it uh, we have a a set of values, and then we're testing to see whether something's part of that set. Um, so here we've got heart. Uh, uh, so it's showing which. It's returning the value that matches uh, the sets. 
if we put in here uh, oh, paid. Uh, oops, did I? Uh, um, uh, change the word shield. Boom. Um, but if it's if it's not matching, um, so as an interesting fact that uh, I found that if you use the the Spanish uh, version of playing cards, then they have things like shield, um, and uh, right, so different names for suits. Uh, and so here we can kind of check to see whether something is if it's part of a set, then we can. Uh, return that value. If it's not part of the set, then it returns nil. So we can use the same kind of thing with our spec here. Uh, so here we're showing true and false. Uh, so we're getting a, a false value here rather than uh, a nil value. So although nil is falsy, it's interpreted as a, a, like a false value, um, the, the valid uh, function is caught is returning a specific uh, false boolean value um, uh, so that's another approach uh, I think yeah we're going to do a one of the examples I'll do next time is to do a uh, card game using that and um, uh, I started having a look at that. I didn't quite finish it yet, but um, so sort of having different kind of suits uh, in here, so we can we can define a spec uh, for, uh, and I'll go through this in a bit more detail uh, later on. Uh, but we can define a spec uh, called uh, suits French, suits German, suits Spanish, suits Italian, suits Swiss German. Uh, these are all on uh, Wikipedia. Uh, so if these are not correct, then it's uh, Wikipedia's fault. And uh, they, the specification for each of these is is simply just a set of the the names of the suits, and we're just using keywords to represent uh, the suit names. Uh, and so, yeah, so like things like uh, yeah, the oh, it's a Swiss German that's using shield instead of um, uh, what we normally use. Uh, and so there are different names for the different suits. And so then if we pass in a uh, a value into the spec, we can test that value to see which of the which of the suits is actually matching. So we can then use spec to determine uh, which of the uh, uh, cards uh, uh, decks uh, are using. Is it using the French style, the German, Spanish, English? I suppose there should be a, an English one or a UK one. And then there's other aspects we can test to see whether, like the rank. So we can define uh, a rank with um, uh, with ace. So rank is all the different cards. So there's 13 different cards in a, uh, in a card deck for each suit. Uh, so here we're just expressing the, the number, the, the, uh, ace card, the the number cards, and then the uh, the court cards or the face cards. Uh, or we could express it more simply, just using range, so we don't have to type in all the numbers. Um, and we can also dock. We can also use the dock as well. So we'll see that in a moment as well. Um, so that's one example of kind of building up uh, using these kind of literal values. So that gives us two options, predicates and literal values for creating specs. Uh, and whenever you're creating a spec, uh, you, we can we can use def like we like we use in closure.core def, or we can use a spec def. So there is a slight difference. Uh, so when we're using spec def, then we're actually uh, registering a uh, spec name uh, inside what it calls its registry. Uh, and so the idea is you would have a registry for uh, your your project or your library uh, and um, all the specs are get registered in that. And if you're using the fully qualified name of the uh, for a, for a, a spec name, 
then it makes it very easy to create a unique set of uh, specs across the entire project or across the entire library. So you don't really want uh, suit to be kind of like have multiple meanings. You want to kind of have uh, uh, specific uh, specs that are unique throughout all your projects and then also throughout all the additional libraries that you would add to your project as well. So if you're adding 10 libraries and all of those have specs, then um, using the fully qualified uh, name for those specs, uh, make sure that there's no clashing. Um, so fully qualified name would be typically the namespace that they're in. Uh, so defining a spec is fairly simple. We just like like def in Closure Core, we're giving it a name and then we're giving it a value, and the value is like the the predicate or the literal value that we've got here. So here we're creating a we're not just creating a suit spec, we're creating a a playing card suit, um, and so that it's got more of a context in there as well. So it's also easier to understand. Uh, what it means by suit. Are we talking about a playing card suit? Are we talking about a suit that you would wear for a job interview? Um, not that I've done that for a while. Um, or a suit you would wear for a wedding, uh, that kind of thing. And so then we can uh, evaluate the uh, def. And this records this playing card suit inside the registry. Uh, and then we can use that from anywhere uh, in our uh, application because it's it should be unique and uh, we can test to see whether something conforms to that and it does so it's returning the conformed value so we know that uh, it's uh, diamond is conforming to the playing card suit specification uh, and we do the same thing for uh, like anything so here we're here we're specifically uh, uh, stating what the uh, the full name of the uh, spec is uh, and he, using the double colon so colon is for just a, a keyword and uh, so in so we have a keyword oops keyword uh, so that's the the kind of the basic uh, syntax of a keyword but we so we can also just like we're doing with namespaces, we can add in a uh, kind of namespace slash uh, then the keyword, uh, and this namespace is still a key because it still starts with a colon. Um, uh, and then rather than having to explicitly type in the namespace, if we're using the current namespace, which we're not. Um, doing so for playing card playing card we're not using the the namespace that this uh, spec is defined in because um, we're using this uh, practically leveraging spec that's the namespace that we're currently in um, so but we can use this double colon to uh, automatically resolve the namespace for us so cat breed would be under uh, the current uh, namespace. So it would take the the namespace from the file it's in uh, and uh, uh, so then we don't have to explicitly type it in. And that's quite useful if we need to move the specs around. Uh, if we move the specs to a different namespace then it's going to uh, uh, we don't need to refactor all the names because they'll just pick up the, the new namespace name. Obviously, if we've called it uh, by its namespace in other areas, then we'll have to update those. Uh, but uh, that should be fairly easy to do. So here we can see that using the double colon, then we've got this practically leveraging spec cat breed. So that is the uh, the automatically resolved namespace for uh, cat breed. Uh, so that saves us uh, some typing uh, there as well. And you can also use that with just normal keywords as well as so outside of spec. Uh, so uh, it's all the same notation. Uh, uh, uh.
And so, yeah, so you can either use the, the namespaces that you're using uh, or um, kind of the library names and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, something that is uh, making it unique, but also ideally you something have something that makes the spec uh, name uh, very meaningful. So it's, it's very hard for uh, not just the computer, but the human uh, developer who's working with the code to understand what the spec uh, is, is about. How are we doing? Oh, yes. Uh, so we did briefly look at this. So there is the doc function inside uh, the closure REPL namespace, or if you're actually running a REPL, then it's already part of uh, that usually, doc, the doc function. So you normally have like doc uh, map. You can type that in the REPL directly, um, or here we it's not included by default, uh, this namespace, so we can just use uh, closure dot REPL, which is the namespace it, re it resides in. And then we can get uh, the, uh, we can call this doc function and it returns nil, but it's it's actually pushing something to the system out, which will appear in my uh, REPL window. So here we've got the, this is the closure core doc string for map. Uh, and so uh, that can be quite useful. And so we can do the same thing for specs. Uh, so we can use closure, uh, closure REPL doc to see what the spec is. And this again also returns nil. I've just copied one it printed out into the REPL buffer here. So this is playing card suits. Uh, it's a spec uh, and this is the specification. So it's printing out the specification of that uh, thing there. Uh, Let's try that through a cat breed as well. Is that security? Uh, yeah, so cat breed, we'll do that for cat breed as well. Let's see. Weep. Uh, whoop. Oops, wrong one. Oh, I'm having terrible trouble controlling my fingers. There we go. Oh, wrong one. Oh, come on. Uh, so that's nil. Let's have a look in the. Yeah. So this is again showing the spec uh, and it's showing the fully qualified name for the spec. So we can kind of see what its full name is and uh, and then the actual specification itself. Uh, there are more uh, breeds of cats than I typed in here, but uh, there was too many. So this is just a sample. So that helps us understand what the spec is, uh, especially if it's uh, if we're using the spec in one namespace and it's defined in a different namespace, then uh, or a different library, uh, then it's it's very easy to see what that spec uh, looks like using the doc. And because we have a registry, uh, we can when we define specs with def. Uh, we can also undefine them, but there isn't an undef uh, function, uh, as far as I know. Um, I haven't seen one. So what it suggested was to do a, yeah, I don't think there's an un, it's an unform. I wonder what that does. Given a spec and a value created by or compliant to call conform with the spec returns value with all conform destructuring undone. Uh, no, so that's not what we're looking for. Uh, yeah, so there isn't uh, a specific uh, undefined, but what you can do is uh, uh, you can define it to nil uh, and uh, it's kind of that removes it from the registry. So if we do, if we have a spec def, which is just uh, it's very simple, unwanted, abandoned. It creates this spec called leveraging spec unwanted. Um, and then if we do conform, then it's it's working. But if we define that to, oh, unform, conform returns X. Okay. Um, but if we set it to nil, uh, then yeah, it's saying it's unable to resolve the spec. So, it, it, so setting it to nil is effectively un 
uh, undefining it. Uh, it no longer exists in the registry. Uh, that's what the uh, the documentation in that getting started uh, suggested. Uh, what does that say? Oop. Um, uh, so from the description, oops, wrong one. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, we don't know what X is, okay. Uh, it's complaining about something that <coughs> oh and form expects two okay um i'll have a look at that later on i'm not going to spend time looking at that but it's uh yeah there's lots of functions that we still need to uh Investigates. Uh, oh, oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so there is an interesting uh, discussion on where to save spec code. Um, and I think it depends on how much spec specifications you're actually using. Uh, I don't think there's a hard and fast place. I do like the idea. <laughs> I do like the idea of having kind of its own namespace, but uh, I think it does depend on what you're actually doing. So if there's only a few definitions, I think including that in the uh, in the kind of application code is is okay to start with, uh, because it's always something you can refactor out anyway. Especially if you're using the auto resolve for the namespaces, it's very easy to then move those specs. Um, if you're doing generative testing, then you could, there's an argument to put it into the, along with the testing namespaces as well. Um, but I think the the more you're using spec, I think it's more likely you're going to have specs in their own kind of namespace. Uh, and uh, I guess it just depends on how big the project is as well. Uh, and then if you do have specs in their own namespace, then uh, putting in relative like conform and valid examples into the namespaces where you're going to use them that would be useful as well. So we're going to uh, expand on that in the broadcast later on as well. So we've just done some very simple specs uh, so far, just individual ones, but we can uh, compose specifications together, which I think is really, really where the power comes. And I think this is where you, what you do to actually build up uh, specifications as well. You're, you're actually going to not build just one giant great big spec you're going to create lots of little specs and then combine them into uh, a spec that covers a more uh, detailed kind of data structure or, or functional argument and so uh, yeah one of the things in, in any language whether it be OO or uh, FP uh, composition is always uh, more effective them building up these big monolith kind of things um, and as it says no spec is an island and so we one of the simplest ways to compose specifications is using the and or or macros um, so you can and things together so again these are just from closure core so we got and um, we've got let's see simple one true and false uh, it's false and um, if we do the same thing for or, we get true. Um, so as long as one of the values is true, then all will pass. And if um, one of the values in and is uh, is not true or uh, is falsy, then it's going to return false. Uh, and one of the interesting things about and is that it will shortcut. So if it's if we did uh, false, if I could type this morning, there we go. If we did false, true, false, it would actually stop at the first false. Uh, it's not something I can kind of show here easily in this expression, but what it's doing is actually it's going to see oh false. Okay, I'm going to stop here because that's false. And uh, 
and so it means that if you put uh, uh, the simplest conditions first, uh, then it doesn't have to do like more long-winded com uh, uh, comparisons checks uh, later on. So it's uh, it's a nice way to shortcut and stop the need for doing uh, like all of the uh, evaluating all of the values here they're all just simple values but we could have one of these as a as a function call that goes off and talks to a database and uh, and so if the simple condition fails then there's no point in actually doing that additional call and this is a reason why uh, one of the reasons why and is a macro because uh, we can interrupt the uh, execution uh, so we can just basically bail out of evaluating something and then um, uh, yeah, like savers doing work that we don't need to do. Uh, so these are closure core. Uh, oh, I can't type closure this morning. So that's part of the core library. Uh, and we can use these, again, we can use these in spec. So here we've got a very simple exam example. So we're doing, uh, we're defining another spec, spec def. Uh, we're using the auto resolve for the namespace. So this is going to be leveraging spec meaning of life. And we want to, um, we're using this spec and to define what the specification actually is. So this is, uh, we're defining the name and then the specification is this whole expression here. And this expression is of two parts. It's a uh, one predicate to take check whether it's an integer, another one to check whether it's uh, an even, and a uh, third part, so it's three parts, sorry, not two, uh, and a third part where we're using this anonymous function uh, to check whether the value is 42. Uh, and so we get our spec, and now that's in our registry. And uh, then we've got, uh, yeah, and then we can also uh yeah play around and do all sorts of things here as well um so here we're using uh, or as well um so this is and and it's very simple it just uses the uh, specs as they are so we've got three different specs there that we're including into a single spec when we're using or uh then um well so when we're using and if any of these fail then it's just going to fail uh, and when uh, this is gonna, when the R is gonna fail, then we're actually uh, adding these like local names, these local keywords uh, for each branch, and that will report back on which of these uh, branches have actually failed. So it adds more information to uh, evaluating the specification when we're using conform, we get more information there. Uh, so we evaluate the spec, then uh, if we evaluate it, it's returning uh, integer 42. So it's showing the fact that it's uh, it's passing the spec and it's passing uh, integer 42. Um, so that's uh, correct. If we do the string, then we can see it's, it's following the string branch of the or. Uh, and so it's following this, uh, this path instead. And so we can see where in the spec it's conformed to. And that can be quite useful for debugging as well. And obviously if we have something, so the meaning of life uh, is entropy. <laughs> entropy entropy uh, always uh, wins out, unfortunately. Um, then we can see that that's invalid. So we're returning the invalid because it's not part of the specification. So all just give us a little bit extra uh, information, a little bit extra feedback when we're actually uh, working with the spec. Uh, and then what about nil values? Yeah, so spec doesn't like nil. Um, well, it's not spec that doesn't like nil. It's like some of the predicates that uh, are used by, uh, can be used by uh, spec. So string predicate, uh, if you give it a nil, it, it doesn't really like it. Um, so it's, um, it's kind of going to return that as false, but we can actually make uh, the specs uh, like it uh, by using this nillable and so if we look at the type of a string then it's returning java like string if we look at the type of a nil then it's returning nil uh, that is its own kind of type it's it's a valid type inside uh, closure but if we make something 
if we make the predicate accept nil by wrapping the predicate in this spec nillable, uh, then we can use nil as a as a as a valid value in the spec as well. So if we've got a a predicate, uh, some kind of condition we want to test, and it's returning nil, and we want to include nil as a as a valid value, uh, we can wrap this little nillable uh, thing in there. I haven't really thought of any ideas why I'd want to do that yet, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, it, again, it's early days, so I'll keep that in mind. Um, so most of the time, our specs have um, our values have conformed to the specification. So what happens when they don't conform? Well, we've seen that we get uh, this uh, values uh, from conform saying uh, it's invalid. Uh, but that doesn't tell us a huge amount about why it's invalid. And uh, so uh, we can use the very handy explain to uh, explain that. Uh, so if we run uh, meaning of life here, if we want to explain, it's actually pushing this out into, again, it's pushing this out into standard out. So it's in the REPL. Uh, and so it's returned, this is, I've just copied this from the REPL window. Uh, and it's saying 24 has failed. Uh, it's failed this particular spec uh, from the spec named uh, meaning of life. So it gives us more information about what's actually gone wrong. Uh, and so we can use that with uh, uh, sort of the, the meaning of life, the one with the, the or spec in there. And uh, it's kind of showing that, uh, yeah, 24 is failing. Uh, the check for 42 uh, uh, at the point integer as well uh, from the practically uh, leveraging uh, spec meaning of life. Uh, and it's also failed at 42 at the string. So we, it's giving us more information about where exactly it's failing. So here we can see it's, it's failing on both of the or tests that we have in the meaning of life int or string spec. Uh, and so rather than print that out to the uh, standard out, you can also use uh, explain string. Uh, our, um, I quite like the explain data, but it's uh, it, it's not very easy to read. Uh, but I, if you use a pretty print version of the evaluation you're using, which is what I'm doing here, so I'm just using pretty print, or you can explicitly wrap this in a pretty print call, uh, then um, it's showing you that it's actually doing explain data is actually returning a key. Uh, sorry, um, so it's returning a map with um, this auto, uh, um, so this map, map literal syntax on it. So what we're basically saying here is that all these keys uh, in the map are belonging to this closure.spec.alpha uh, namespace. Uh, so an example here is that, yeah, so if we have, this is the result of our uh, explain data. And so it's got this hash in front of the colon. Uh, and that is basically setting a namespace for all the keys in the map. Uh, and so you can do this in just normal closure core as well. And so what that really means is that this kind of closure.spec alpha is in front of all of these keywords. So it looks more like this. And obviously that's a little bit more um, involved to read, although eventually you'll kind of just blur out the closure.spec alpha. Um, but yeah, so that's just adding all the, making sure all the keys are, have the fully qualified namespace on there. So that's quite a useful little um, uh, uh, technique to use. Um, yeah. Yeah, so just, uh, and then using the, you can also use that with auto resolve. So this uh, um, double colon is going to take the namespace from the current file, uh, and then it's going to apply it to all the keys in the map. So we get uh, this, uh, this is the same as that. I hope that makes sense. Um, And then uh, I think we've got time for this. Yeah, we've got a little bit more. Might overrun a little bit, uh, but I think it's useful to cover some entity maps here. Um, so if we're going to call a function 
uh, then in Clojure, a common approach is to rather than just give it individual uh, arguments, rather than just having a a defin uh, of like function name, uh, and then we can have we can explicitly say what the arguments are: CSV uh, location dates. So that's kind of hard coded now into well that's the that's the specification for this function call. Uh, rather than do that, you could pass in a, a map. So we could call a function with a map, uh, and then it doesn't matter if we actually pass more information to that function. Uh, it will still work because it's only going to pull from the map uh, the the values it needs. Uh, and we could also write the function so that uh, if there was one of these things missing. It would still work. We just use a default value for for these inside the function. So using uh, passing a map uh, as an argument is one way to um, to manage the uh, complexity around passing uh, yeah, data as arguments to functions. Uh, and so we can also put a spec around that uh, when we're doing that. Uh, and again, we build that up um, yeah piece by piece as normal. Um, and so an example is if we were going to have an account, uh, and I think I'll go into this in a bit more detail in the next broadcast, but basically this is how I would design, uh, I have this how I've started designing a spec for like a bank account. So you've got an online bank that you're just signing up to and it needs specific kind of information. So I've kind of designed this uh, outside in and uh, we've got this uh, bank account uh, which has an account holder. So you're, you register as an account holder. Um, so this is a spec uh, uh, name. And then the spec itself is uh, is made up of other specs. So there's uh, we, we're including the key uh, names. The keys are the names of the other specs that we're going to uh, include. And so uh, we have uh, specs that are required and specs that are optional. Uh, so there's some flexibility. So uh, like specs can kind of say whether you know, values are have to be included or whether it can be optional. And so required ones, all these specs need to be there. Otherwise it's going to fail. Uh, and additionally, so we can we need to register our name, email address, home, home address, and social security ID. These are um, essential pieces of information we need to be able to uh, include uh, as an account holder. If we don't have them, we can't have an account at a bank. Um, but we can be an account holder and not have any active accounts associated with us. Uh, so that's optional. Um, so this is kind of the, the top level uh, spec. And so this would, this, should, this should really come last in the, in the code order. Um, but this is how I kind of designed it like from outside in. And I thought, well, then, so we've got all these, I need first name, last name, and then what are the specs for each of these keys I'm including? Um, oh, and I think I've missed one, actually. I should be have an account ID in there, shouldn't I? Oops. Uh, ID. Uh, and then, yeah, so we just, the actual individual ones are fairly straightforward uh, here. Uh, the email address. I'm just using this regex that I got from the internet to um, to check. It's the the e the email addresses of the right form. It's and it's also in a string because that's the the form we we're actually going to process it in. Which enclosure makes sense. We put uh, a, an email address inside a string, um, and then uh, well, the account ID would probably be uh, actually a UUID. So a unique universal ID, um, and then uh, so we've got the home address. Uh, that probably should be something better than just a string. Uh, and then the social security ID. I actually found a really interesting uh, library which is specifically for social security number validation uh, and generation of spec. So I'll actually expand on this example a little bit more and try and pull in this library and see what we can do with that. Because um, just having a string again isn't really checking the, the sort form. We want something a bit more rigorous like the uh, the email check. But for now it's uh, 
it's kind of like just a keyword defining. So these are all the like the essential uh, keys that we need for our account holder spec. And then we've got this associated accounts. So if we, we have an associated account, we that requires something that is of a, a bank account um, at the moment, although we could have uh, mortgage uh, and other types of accounts in here as well. Um, and it might be that in order to have a mortgage, you need to have a bank account. So you might make the bank account required and the, uh, uh, the mortgage uh, optional. Uh, and then, so the, so the associate account says a bank account. So what does a bank account look like? Uh, so bank account again is, is something that's also composed of like a bank account ID, bank account balance, status, arranged overdraft, then optionally, whether we want to receive alerts, uh, or just, uh, or just maybe we just want, uh, alerts for everything that the bank, do, the bank account does, or maybe we just want optional alerts as well. Um, so we can extend on that. And so the bank account ID is a UUID, bank account balance is a number. Um, uh, status is just a literal value, so we're using credit or overdrawn. Uh, arranging an overdraft, we're just checking that we're not giving somebody an overdraft of more than a, a thousand. Uh, and then the bank account alerts are Again, just another literal value, yes, warnings, or no. Yeah, uh, and then we can test uh, whether something's valid. Uh, and uh, here, we, we're not passing in all the information, so it's gonna be false. So we just need to um, give it all the information we need. Uh, and uh, we can explain, again, we can use the explain to find out why it's not uh, valid. Um, there we go. Ooh. So here I'm going to pretty print to that. Uh, and so we've got some information about why they're not valid. I mean, I know that they're they're not valid because I'm not passing in enough information, but when I do, then they should uh, should pass. Um, I haven't found the, the data as easy to understand uh, as the, just the explain. The explain is a lot uh, uh, clearer uh, in general. Uh, because it's actually including a, a fail. Um, yeah, so it's actually here, it's showing that yeah, fail, it's failed, this contains uh, social security ID. So the explain one is more specific, uh, whereas the kind of the, the data one, you have to kind of process uh, why it's failed as well. Um, so that's all I'm going to cover today. We're a bit over time, but uh, hopefully you're still with us. Uh, so that gives you hopefully like the, the real kind of fundamentals of uh, getting started with spec. Uh, so starting off with simple predicates to do the tests uh, using this uh, with conform and validate and explain to understand what's going on. Uh, and then just an example, yeah, how to build something very simple. And again, I just did this last night, so there might be some tweaks. I want to make to the bank account, but um, yeah, it's fairly easy just to build up a spec, define a spec uh, from lots of other simpler specs uh, and just using a bit of uh, composite design. Uh, and then we'll start next week, we'll start kind of using these against uh, some actual code as well. So I'll write a little prog uh, project to actually um, have a bank account and create things and check things out with the spec. Okay, Boop. Um, so that's everything I'm going to cover today. Hope they found that very useful. And again, if you want to uh, reach out to me, then uh, close your ends practically is a good place. Uh, you want to discuss that things. Uh, some of the comments I'm going to go through. So like Simon, I'm going to go through your comments a bit more and, uh, and try and incorporate that into future broadcasts as well. Um, but thanks again for all your feedback. It's been great to have uh, people putting things into the chat it makes it more uh, engaging for me as well. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And um, so I shall see you next time. I hope you have a lovely and safe weekend. And uh, thanks very much for joining. Goodbye.
Let's dream. Yes, it is. 